This is a download from the BBC. To find out more and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk. Hello. Someone claiming to be Tom Archer has returned from Canada. But what has happened to his voice? The new voice sounds exactly like the voice of Charlie, and I'm sure this is going to cause confusion. Could they really not have found anyone with a more unique voice? Also back this week, Home Front, Radio 4's World War I drama, which lasts as long as the war itself. I've been behind the scenes to see what's involved in making a 600-part epic. Hopefully one of the enjoyable things about listening to Home Front is that you're finding out untold stories, and so we're trying to sort of find out the secrets that people don't know already. And what do you really think of Radios 4 and 5 and their extra bits? The BBC Trust wants your views for a major review it's conducting and promises confidentiality. But will your views change anything? We are there to represent the licence fee payer and this is part of that commitment. I wouldn't want your listeners ever to think that they were taking part in a superficial exercise. More from the BBC trustee Ellen Claus stevens later. But first, to the cause of heated debate and emotional scenes in the Bolton household. I refer, of course, to Ambridge. Tony is still on a ventilator. Peggy sounds as if she might peg out. Jennifer seems to think Carol Tregoran might have murdered Jenny's former lover. Helen is still being ruthlessly manipulated by Rob. And David and Ruth have sold their souls for £7 million. In short, just about everybody is on the edge of a nervous breakdown. But never fear. Tom is back to sort things out. You may remember he left fiancée Kirsty sobbing at the altar and flew off to Canada in May this year. When he left, he sounded like this. So I've come back to pack a few things and to say goodbye. Now he's back at his father's hospital bedside, sounding a little different. But you can't run away forever, can you? And more and more, I realised that's exactly what I'd done. No, he hasn't had a voice transplant. It is, of course, a new actor playing Tom Archer. Tom Graham... Nuggets! ...who played the role for 17 years, has been dropped in favour of William Troughton. I just want to be like you. He's the son of David Troughton, who, since January, has played Tom's dad, Tony Archer. Truly, Tom! By the way, David's father, Patrick played the second Doctor Who. Sausages! Quite a family. At the same time, I hope you're following all of this, David and Ruth's rebellious daughter Pip has returned from university, and she too is being played by a new actor with the wonderfully rustic name of Daisy Badger. I've fixed it. Her character has seemed to change along with her voice. What is going on? A great many Ambridge fans have told us that they are more than a little perturbed. Diane Berger, London. After 40 years of listening to the Archers, I'm on the verge of giving up. And last night was the final straw. The new Tom. I don't know what to say. Just anything. Why doesn't the current writer face the public and explain his reasons behind all this nonsense? I had to face up to what I'd done. Angela Findlay from Devon. I'm sure that many listeners have been wondering, as I've been, what qualities the new actor playing Tom Archer would have that the previous one lacked. We now have the answer, the ability to sound exactly like Charlie Thomas. Right then, Charlie, what was so important? Justin asked me to pay you a visit. He's aware that Brookfield's on the market and he's keen to express his interest. My name is Leslie Irwin. Pip is another case in point. She is a 23-year-old who, when she left, was a seriously stroppy teenager. Dad, face it! I'm not a child anymore! I'm allowed to think for myself! She comes back sounding like a 35-year-old, ultra-mature woman. I know. I have no idea how you cope without me. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know that university changes people, but not that much. My name is Alison Newell, and I live in Poynton in Cheshire. As listeners, we buy into the characters absolutely. And although this new actor did a good job with his bedside scene at the hospital, it was meaningless because to us, he's a stranger. What on earth is the editor thinking? Well, naturally, we once again asked the author of all this mischief, the editor of The Archer, Sean O'Connor, to come on to feedback. But we're told he's up to his eyes recording the Christmas special. We hope, though, that he'll be able to answer your questions next week. 
and no doubt the Archer's furor will crop up when we talk to the controller of Radio 4, Gwyneth Williams, when she comes on to feedback in two weeks' time to take questions directly from listeners. And if you'd like a one-to-one with the person ultimately responsible for what goes out on this network, tell us what you would like to ask her. Contact details coming up later. Now, the BBC Trust also wants to know what you think about Radio 4, as well as for Extra, 5 Live and 5 Live Sports Extra. The Trust has just launched what it calls a service review of these networks and says its conclusions will be influenced by the views of listeners. The trustee leading this review is Ellen Kloss-Stevens. I asked her what's the point of a service review like this one. Well, I know that you've got a loyal band of listeners who give you feedback all the time, but this is really about a feedback on the whole service. We're asking uh, the audiences to take a step back and think about the whole mix of the of the service, the tone of the service, whether it pleases them, whether there are other things that they would like from that service, and just give us an overall view, which is a little bit different from the normal feedback procedure. Do you have any particular areas of concern that you want to hear about? Worries? I mean, the traditional worry about Radio 4, for example, is the average age of its audience, I think it's about 54, 55 now, and the fact that the further away you go from London, the smaller proportion of the population listening population listens. Well, we have to balance that against the fact that Radio 4, for example, has a has a huge reach, over 11 million people a week tuning in. And, of course, Radio 5 Live has over 6 million. So, you know, they, they earn their way into the affection of the audience. So, yes, there would be areas of some concern, but it's not my job uh, as a lead trustee on this review to air my concerns or the trust concerns. No, but you direct it, don't you? I mean, you look no, at the evidence really. and you, you look- think, hold on, that's particularly interesting. Uh, don't worry about this. We better prioritise that. That um, does happen. I think that's editorialising it a bit. You so don't do that? I think that when you look at the questionnaire, we've been extraordinarily open-ended. It simply asks you to really think about what you like, what you don't like, um, how you value the, the content, and also about the digital future. But you can't, you can't judge the results or say that the results of this survey will be representative I mean, it's whoever wants to bother to fill Uh, it out and to do it. And therefore, you can't say this is an accurate slap shot of anything other than the people who've contacted you. It's representative of the people who contact us. That's undoubtedly true. It's also supplemented by statistical analysis, um, audience research and performance research, which we will put all together. But in reply to your question also about whether, uh, you know, whether there's anything wrong, this is not necessarily a fault-finding exercise. It's actually about trying to make it as best as it can be. But it's some, an evolving thing. But sometimes you do find things which you are unhappy with, or less happy with, shall we say. And the last review, you called on Radio 4 to appeal more to younger replenisher, so-called replenisher listeners, and to attract a bigger audience from outside the southeast. And Five Live, for example, should broaden the scope of its sports coverage to be to avoid being dominated by football. So what absolutely, so, yeah, absolutely. So what happens if this time so, you find the same issues well, and nothing's happened in well, the interim? as part of the review, obviously, we'll be looking at, we would be foolish not to look at what we said last time and to assess that. But also every year, the Trust has a services day with the head of services, at which we hope the progress has been made against the and if recommendations. It's not made, but if the progress hasn't been made, are you going well, to deal with let, it internally? Are you going to say me... to the audience, hold on, we recognise... <laughs> The management hasn't delivered in this area. They've fallen down. They need to deliver. Or are you going to tap them on the shoulder, but, you know, in the privacy of your office? No, uh, let let me just give you a, a, an indication of the strength of the recommendations, because I wouldn't want your listeners ever to think that they were taking part in a in a, in, a, in a superficial exercise. So, uh, for example, we said about uh, uh, Five Live that there should be a greater variety of sports. I was up in Salford a fortnight ago with Jonathan Wall, and the he, controller of Five Live, the controller of Five Live, and he now tells me that. On Five Live Extra, for example, there are now 30 different sports, which is, you know, a 
a, a huge difference to the kind of idea that it could have been dominated by football. Now, if people want to contribute to this particular survey, mm -hmm. how can they do it? Well, they can do it through uh, email, uh, they can do it through Twitter, and they can do it online. And also, if you're not into um, any form of new media, there is a phone number that people can ring up and get a, uh, a printed out questionnaire that's um, sent to your home. And then when will you report? By June, we should have a published uh, review, which will be published to everybody. People can pore over it and can hold us to an account later on. BBC trustee Ellen Kloss-Stevens. And if you want to have your views included in that review of Speech Radio, details of how to do so are on our website. Go on, tell them what you really think. Now, fans of Innuendo were vibrating with delight this week as the aforementioned trust ruled that Samantha can carry on scoring with Jack D. They were responding to a complaint from a listener, a listener, that the regular jokes at the expense of I'm sorry I haven't a clue's imaginary scorer were sexist and outdated. Back in June, it was reported, but later denied, that Jack D had threatened to quit the show if he was forced to tone down the Samantha Dubla entendres in the face of a single complaint. The vast majority of feedback listeners at the time rallied to his and the programme's defence. My name is Philip Saunders and I'm from Bungay. I was shocked, shocked to hear that one complaint had caused anyone in the BBC to do anything about anything. Any attempt to interfere with the programme's level of smut will have me reaching for the appropriate knob. Hello, I'm Jenny Bradley from Kingston in Surrey. Don't let's give in to the fun dampeners. Surely we women are big enough to enjoy the odd Samantha innuendo. Samantha jokes are really quite naughty, but they're clever as well and they're witty and they're jokes that suddenly make you explode with laughter. Most of you seem to agree. But Charlie Moritz feels the Trust has got it wrong. They're condoning and normalising sexual objectification of women and dated, dodgy, chauvinistic ribaldry. Whilst the intention of the production team and talent will, I'm sure, be innocent, the effect flowing from appearing to condone and normalise such humour may very well be anything but innocent and harmless. Charlie Moritz. As ever, let us know what you think about that or anything else on BBC Radio. You can write to Feedback, P.O. Box 67234, London SE1 P4AX, or leave a phone message on 03 333 444. Standard landline charges apply, but it could cost more on some mobile networks. Or you could send an email to feedback at bbc.co.uk, and you can tweet us at BBC R4 Feedback. All those details are on our website. Now, you and yours fans bemoaning the loss of 12 minutes of their programme may not like it, but Radio 4's World War I drama Homefront is here to stay for the duration. It's just returned for Series 2, episodes 45 to 74 out of a total of approximately 600. A good time for feedback to go behind the scenes, to look at how editor Jessica Dromgoul and her team go about producing a drama that sets out to document the daily lives of those left at home during the Great War. Please do not enter when the red light shows. Well, the red light's on, so we can't go in yet. I look down the corridor and we can see lots of photographs of the arches. David? Ruth? Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's uh, as on her way to the door. Shush, hush now. I'm, I'm here. Yeah. Don't cry, don't cry. We're just coming to the main studio and actually on the far side, uh, Jessica, who's directing this particular episode with Martha, who looks after all of the sound effects, and they're just working out where they're going to record things and how. Um, we'll go with the wooden rings, don't you? Yeah. Love now, Jessica, I always wonder, coming to a studio, whether we should actually tell the truth, because... We'd like to believe that here we're now in Tynemouth, and uh, I'm looking at the old Victorian streets. Uh, <laughs> but it's really just like a large, what, school or village hall, isn't it? It is. On this side of it, uh, the walls are all reflective, so this is what we use for our indoor spaces. Uh, 
it's better oh, kitchen because... Oh, this does look like, to be fair, this does look like a kitchen. It's pretty well equipped, I'd have thought. It is. I mean, we're, we're fortunate sharing with Ambridge because they have Belfast sinks and they have beautiful old fittings and they have the Argo. And, uh, this is the Archer's Argo, is it's, it? It's also the Wilson's Range. Thank All you right. for asking. So, do I just take it up to them like this? No, you've got to warm it up first in the oven. All right, give it. I mean, there's a very pragmatic reason for having a good kitchen, which is that an awful lot of drama happens in kitchens. Oh, no wonder you can't sleep. I'll put the kettle on. There's a pot made. It might be stewed by now. Hello, I'm Martha Little-Hales. I'm the lead studio manager on Homefront. Well, Martha, when you're recording, do you sort of lay down, as it were, a basic track of people's voices and then add all of the sounds in post-production? No. We, what, we have to work quite fast. We record 30 minutes of drama in a day, which is very quick. And so we try and put on as much as we can as we go along. For example, if I was building a street scene, I might think about what the street was and then I might think, Ooh, I need a bit of Atmos. Where's I need... that, by the way? That's uh, Newcastle, is this, it? This is Time Mouth, yes. I'm already working on season three. So somebody's already created that, created Time Mouth, if you like, and you can, you know, fed it up and down at your will. I can, or I can decide to myself. I can think... Oh, watch out, I think, horses going past. Uh, absolutely. Don't and I can think to myself, well, that's the sort of slightly posher end of town, but perhaps if I added some children in, children playing on the streets... And then maybe if I put a factory in. So you're working down towards the factory now. Can we just step inside then? Because it's a bit loud here on the street, yes? <laughs> Thank you very much. There yeah. you go. I've got a question from Nigel Atkinson here who wonders about the reconnaissance plane flying overhead in an earlier episode. It did rather sound like a modern jet aircraft, he said, and jets only entered the scene from 1944. So, Martha, was it a jet? <laughs> it absolutely wasn't a jet. You've no idea how much research I do on every single thing that we have to play in. I did cheat. It's, it's a Bristol fighter, and those didn't actually come online until 1916. And you but there were Bristol, ah, right. Bristol planes before then. Why did you have to cheat? Because there isn't anything of... There wasn't anything, so... You may find a little bit of painting, uh, something approximate, something a little bit out of focus. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, we've settled down here in the studio on these extremely comfortable, but I'm afraid to say 21st century seats, I think. And I'm with Jessica Dromgoul, who's the director and editor of Homefront, and also uh, with Lucy Collingwood, the producer-director. Jessica, once you've got this enormous commission, you know it's nearly 600 programmes, you know it's each programme will be around 12, 12 and a half minutes. How on earth did you decide on the structure? We came rather late to the form uh, as part of our development of the first season, so after planning the sort of larger arcs of story, we then hit on this idea of doing individual stories, different character per episode, as the story of their day. And what it really was, a conscious decision not to be a soap. And I find that with a soap, when you move from one storyline to another within a tiny space of time, it's as if you're kind of trivialising the one you're leaving behind. People have written to feedback. The audience is split between those who love it and those who say, I'm afraid, that the horn at the start is their cue to switch off. This is listener Haley Hyde Andrews. 600 episodes of Homefront over four years. Having listened to a few episodes, I cannot believe how bad it is. All chirpy chappies and poshos delivering excruciating scripts. I had no idea it was supposed to be some kind of tribute to World War I. It's not. A lot of people like Haley said you're not getting at the huge loss... Is that because it's only 1914, the first series? Lucy? Um, yes. When we start in Folkestone, which was a tourist destination seaside resort, at the beginning of the war, just as it breaks out, they don't know what's coming. They think the war is going to only last for a certain amount of time. And because we've got this much um, story to tell, we will be dealing with the Somme, the, the huge devastation of war. What about Haley's uh, complaint? Again, it's all really about sort of chirpy chappies and poshos. There have been so many World War I dramas. Is it difficult to find sort of original characterization? 
Well, we have done, um, as a team, have had quite a lot of research done and we've used the local papers, um, local historians coming to talk to us, you know, spent time in Folkestone, spent time in Tynemouth and really tried to get a feel for the for the real characters that, that were out there. I feel like we try and cover quite a lot of ground in terms of the social world of Folkestone in season one and season two. Well, here's another critical listener, Barry Elson. I was under the impression that this programme was designed to give a day-by-day account of life in Britain a hundred years ago. But in reality, it's merely a reprise of life in a coastal town. And instead of addressing the serious political issues and the government's handling of the war, it's mainly trivia. Where is the sort of serious political and government handling questions? It's not something we're addressing. We're absolutely representing the impotent ordinary people of Britain. So we, we made a very strong decision not to feature Whitehall, not to feature too much military at all, except in the way that it sort of impacts on the town of Folkestone. Hopefully one of the enjoyable things about listening to Homefront is that you're finding out untold stories and actually you can find out a lot of information about the political situation at the time. And so we're trying to to sort of find out the secrets that people don't know already. Well, there are plenty of listeners who think you're getting it right, including Catherine Turner. Homefront, absolutely love it. What a brilliant tribute to those who lived through that time, whether fighting in appalling conditions or trying to make ends meet at home. I'd be really interested to know how much the actors and producers had drawn upon the war experiences of their own relatives as a basis for their portrayal. Lucy, did you have any family memories of the First World War that have crept into writers' minds, or you've placed them in writers' minds? Well, my um, great-grandfather ran a factory in in the Newcastle area, so although um, when we reached Newcastle Tynemouth in our season three, um, it isn't my great-grandfather's factory, he was very keen to look after the workers and try, and was quite progressive and our factory owner is similarly progressive. And I know you want to, don't want to give storylines away, but listener Alison Williams, perhaps like a lot of others, wants to influence the future direction of the series. Will there be a conscientious objector storyline in the next series? I think it would be really helpful to have that storyline and get people to think about a culture of peace. Conscientious objection really became... Uh, a much bigger issue when conscription came in, which was in um, 1916. And so, yes, we have plans to cover that, but not until later on. Although, in season two, which is our season with an overarching theme of recruitment, there are some members of Folkestone who are less in favour of the war and are pacifist and so have the potential to be conscientious objectors later on. It's and how far, how far ahead are the writers? Have they reached 1916 yet, or are they still in 1915? 1915. 1915. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know where your characters will be, though, at the end of the war? Or is there a real sense that as they evolve and as listeners react to them, maybe their future will change? It's a, it's a really good question. Uh, we have some ideas, but we're prepared to sacrifice them if what we find out and where we go between now and the end of the war is more interesting. Um, we currently live in 1915, don't we? We do. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Jessica Dromgoul, the editor of Homefront and producer Lucy Collingwood, who know exactly what they will be doing for the next four years. Only another 550 episodes to go. Now, last week's Archive on Four left many listeners, myself included, a little dewy-eyed as we were transported by the power of radio back to our childhoods. Good morning, children. Run quickly now on the tips of your toes and group yourselves round the wireless. Ah, Jarvis Cocker's programme looking at the history of singing together, the long-running BBC Schools radio programme. It moved a number of listeners to get in touch with their own memories of long-gone school days, when gloomy Mondays in the classroom were briefly brightened by a good old sing-song, and the naughty boys at the back of the class rewrote the verses to reflect their scatological obsessions. Not me, of course. Cockles and mussels, alive, alive, oh. I first heard that song on a BBC Schools programme over 40 years ago. Michael Tarrant, Wincanton, Somerset. It was a rare pleasure to listen to Singing Together Archive Hour. 
Jarvis Cocker spoke with genuine sympathy for the subject. Oh yes, now I, that's more like it. I do remember that. My name is Anne Deves and I live in Lower Upna. It brought back so many wonderful memories of my primary school days. I was delighted to hear Michael Finnegan again. We drove the teacher's potty on the coach, singing it again and again and again. Michael Finnegan always pleased little boys because they could shout out, begin again. Ruth Davison, Newton Abbey, Northern Ireland. I learned so much from those programs. History, geography, cultural heritage, and mutual understanding. There's a problem. Most material from this time wasn't saved, and only a handful of Singing Together episodes survive in the BBC archive. My name's Ruth Evans, and I produced the Archive on Four about Singing Together. Jarvis Cocker did an appeal on the PM programme, which had a huge response. My archive search probably delivered less than, certainly less than 20 separate recordings, and some of them were just fragments, you know, individual songs. My name is Christopher Goodman from York. I have uh, quite a lot of recordings, at least 40-odd recordings of singing together. The first one was 1973. My final recording is from 2004. It was amazing to hear about Christopher's collection. Um, That definitely sounds like the biggest collection that I've come across. Um, most of the people that I found, you know, they just had a couple of tapes, you know, a few cassettes that they'd held on to all these years. Um, I was a little bit sad that I hadn't um, managed to find him, you know, before the programme went out, because it would have been brilliant to hear more about him and why he put that collection together. I hate missing episodes of programmes. I much prefer keeping long collections of programmes I love. And I started collecting them as soon as we got a cassette recorder device at my parents' home. Ready? One, two. There was a huge amount of interest in singing together, so I think Christopher's collection will you know, have huge value for other programme makers and the BBC archives. Singing together, it means everything. The songs in my life, they bring back many happy memories. Listener Christopher Goodman, who has succeeded where the BBC failed in saving a little bit of our musical heritage for posterity. My favourite song was this. I'm a little teapot, short and stout, Here's my handle, here's my spout. When I get my steam up, hear me shout. Pick me up and pour me out. Would you like to hear the second verse? Thought not. Goodbye. Tony Archer. Truly, Tom. By the way, David's father, Patrick, played the second Doctor Who. Sausages! Quite a family. At the same time, I hope you're following all of this, David and Ruth's rebellious daughter Pip has returned from university, and she too is being played by a new actor with the wonderfully rustic name of Daisy Badger. I fixed it. Her character has seemed to change along with her voice. What is going on? A great many Ambridge fans have told us that they are more than a little perturbed. Diane Berger, London. After 40 years of listening to The Archers, I'm on the verge of giving up. And last night was the final straw. The new Tom. I don't know what to say. Just anything. Why doesn't the current writer face the public and explain his reasons behind all this nonsense? I had to face up to what I'd done. Angela Findlay from Devon. I'm sure that many listeners have been wondering, as I've been, what qualities the new actor playing Tom Archer would have that the previous one lacked. We now have the answer the ability to sound exactly like Charlie Thomas. Right then, Charlie, what was so important? Justin asked me to pay you a visit. He's aware that Brookfield's on the market and he's keen to express his interest. My name is Leslie Irving. Pip is another case in point. She is a 23-year-old who, when she left, was a seriously stroppy teenager. Dad, face it! I'm not a child anymore! I'm allowed to think for myself! She comes back sounding like a 35-year-old 
ultra mature woman. I know. I have no idea how you cope without me. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know that university changes people. Down. But never fear. Tom is back to sort things out. You may remember he left fiance Kirsty sobbing at the altar and flew off to Canada in May this year. When he left, he sounded like this. So I've come back to pack a few things and to say goodbye. Now he's back at his father's hospital bedside, sounding a little different. But you can't run away forever, can you? And more and more, I realise that's exactly what I'd done. No, he hasn't had a voice transplant. It is, of course, a new actor playing Tom Archer. Tom Graham, Nuggets, who played the role for seventeen years, has been dropped in favour of William Troughton. I just want to be like you. He's the son of David Troughton, who since January has played Tom's dad. This is a download from the BBC. To find out more and for our terms of use. Please go to bbc.co.uk. Hello. Someone claiming to be Tom Archer has returned from Canada, but what has happened to his voice? The new voice sounds exactly like the voice of Charlie, and I'm sure this is going to cause confusion. Could they really not have found anyone with a more unique voice? Also back this week, Home Front, Radio Four's World War One drama, which lasts as long as the war itself. I've been behind the scenes to see what's involved in making a six hundred part epic. Hopefully, one of the enjoyable things about listening to Home Front is that you're finding out untold stories, and so we're trying to sort of find out the secrets that people don't know already. And what do you really think of radios four and five and their extra bits? The BBC Trust wants your views for a major review it's conducting, and promises confidentiality. But will your views change anything? We are there to represent the licence fee payer, and this is part of that commitment. I wouldn't want your listeners ever to think that they were taking part in a superficial exercise. More from the BBC trustee Ellen Clos Stevens later. But first, to the cause of heated debate and emotional scenes in the Bolton household. I refer, of course, to Ambridge. Tony is still on a ventilator. Peggy sounds as if she might peg out. Jennifer seems to think Carol Tregoran might have murdered Jenny's former lover. Helen is still being ruthlessly manipulated by Rob. And David and Ruth have sold their souls for seven million pounds. In short, just about everybody is on the edge of a nervous breakdown.